go ahead and mute everyone if I know how to do that. We're, um, That was sneaky, Ruth. Muted me too. Oh, that was you, Miriam? <laughs> so anyway, thank you everybody for coming tonight. It's so great to see so many people supporting this event and our Akiba Schechter community. Um, as Carla said, I see many familiar faces tonight and some I don't know yet. My name is Ellie Goodman. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Akiba PTO and we're so glad we're here. you're here with us tonight. Today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, the 76th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau camps in 1945. We are honored that Ben Garber will share his story of survival with us to help commemorate this day. If you have questions during Ben's talk, please put them in the chat and we'll have time to answer them at the end of the program. Before we get started, I want to thank Jill Weinberg, who I think is here tonight, the director of the Midwest region of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum for her help in organizing tonight's event. And now it is my great privilege to introduce Mally Rutkoff to start our program. Mally is the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. She served as the Chicago and national chair of the Children of Survivors Group. And she is very active in the museum and helps to preserve and share her parents and other stories for generations to come. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mally. Thank you, Ellie. I'm unmuted, okay. It is my pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you, Ellie, for creating this evening's program. As a child of uh, my mother who survived Auschwitz and my Hardly. father survived yeah. in hiding, I can attest to their deepest concerns that no one would care or remember what they had endured or the tremendous losses when they were gone. Tonight's program would have pleased my parents tremendously and allayed their deepest fears. I consider it a privilege to introduce you to you, Dr. Benjamin Garber. I've known Ben for many years and am most grateful that he's willing to share his Holocaust experiences with you tonight. Dr. Garber was born in Wilno, Poland and came to the United States in 1949. He lived in Peoria, Illinois, where he attended high school and Bradley University. Dr. Garber attended the medical school at the University of Illinois and did his internship, residency, and fellowship at Michael Reese Hospital. He's one of the founders and director of the Barr Harris Children's Grief Center of the Chicago Psychoanalytic Institute. Dr. Garber is the author of two books and 33 clinical papers. He still practices full time and is currently finishing his autobiography entitled A Child from the Ghetto. Dr. Garber and his wife Wiley are the parents of three children and eight grandchildren. And I saw that some of them are joining with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ben Garber and thank you, Ben, for sharing your story with us tonight. Thank you, Mary. Uh, the summer before last, my three children came to me and they said, Dad, uh, when they all three of them come together, I know it's trouble. So they said, Dad, uh, we know that you've written a lot. You've written books, you've written articles, uh, you've given a lot of talks, but you have never talked and never written about your Holocaust experience. I have to admit I was somewhat taken back by that, being exposed to that, and I got very defensive. And I said to them, well, uh, if I write about it, I mean, who will I write it for? They said, well, for, for yourself, for us. And then there may be other people who may be interested in your story. And so tonight, all of you happen to be the other people. And this is my story. As the Germans set up the ghetto in Vilna, they tried to squeeze all the Jews of Vilna into one small part of the city. It was the old part with narrow cobblestone streets. And, and my parents' house and my grandparents' house were just inside the borders of the ghetto, close to the main gate. So all of a sudden, there were all these strangers in our house while my mother, my grandmother, and I possessed the bedroom, which at the time was a luxury. 
because these were all people who were removed from their homes. Uh, gradually, the number of people in the house diminished as people were removed from the ghetto. While I was not totally aware of what was occurring, I did realize that people were disappearing. The Germans would suddenly swoop down, whether it be night or day, and forcibly remove people from the streets and from the houses. The raids were called axes or actions. People were loaded into waiting trucks, and we were told that they were being taken to labor camps. That implied that they were coming back. However, we soon realized that they were taken to destinations unknown and that they were never coming back. As a result, hiding had became a common activity when it was realized that the Germans were coming. We were preoccupied with finding new, more obscure and creative hiding places. Once we hid in the attic of my grandmother's house, there were many people, it was crowded, hot and uncomfortable. There was no water and food. At first, there was a sense that we were all in this together, but after a while, tempers were frayed and there were arguments. The stress of having to hide and the fear of being caught, removed, and was ever present danger and also anxiety provoking. Another time, we were hiding in the cellar, and once again, there were many people, and there were a couple with a baby. The baby started to cry, and we could hear the Germans outside. If the baby didn't stop crying, he would be discovered and that would be the end. Finally, somebody suggested stuffing a rag in the baby's mouth so she couldn't cry. Eventually, it, it, fortunately, it never came to that as the Germans left and we survived this time. One of my earliest memories is when I was three or four years old. And I went with my mother and my nanny to go visit the doctor because of my delicate stomach. And so as it was a beautiful summer day when all of a sudden German airplanes appeared and bombs started exploding all around. If you've ever heard the whistling sound of a bomb coming down to earth, it's something you'll never forget. And so as the bombs permeated the, the air, the three of us started running and the whistling noise of falling bombs seemed all around us. So fortunately we survived this pretty well and went back to our home. What I did not understand nor appreciate was that my grandparents' house was in a perfect location. It was on a corner of two large intersecting streets. Since it was next to the main gate of the ghetto, then one could observe people coming and going. It was next to the main gate and then one could see what was going on. We could see the guards, their changing shifts, their interactions, and by the uniforms, we could tell which were German and which were Lithuanians. We were also in a position to count ambulances since a large hospital was not far from the ghetto. The more ambulances were seen going back and forth, especially in the winter, it was assumed to be a sign that the Germans were losing the war. It was these kind of observations, whether accurate or not, that fueled our optimism and hopes of the approaching liberation. If the part of our character structure is often shaped and molded by disturbing events from our childhood, then this would partly explain my tendency to be quiet, to be somewhat secretive, and to avoid attracting attention. These incidents are some of my earliest memories of the occupation. There were others, but I picked these because I think they were rather significant. I attribute meaning and significance to these events in determining who I was and who I became. I'm also aware that our knowledge as to how and why people turn out the way they do is very limited. There are just too many variables in shaping one's character. So I feel somewhat entitled to attribute meaning to these events and their impact on my psyche. However, before I become too glib in attributing causality to random events, it, let's not for, lose sight of the fact that these incidents happen within a matrix of constant fear and terror. The Vilna Ghetto was created in 1941 and liquidated in September of 1943. 
I know this because my mother and I escaped the ghetto the night before it was liquidated. It was one of the numerous coincidences that contributed to our survival. We all now had a population of 60,000 Jews. The ghetto had a population of 40,000, of which 1,300 survived. The ghetto became a self-contained entity, closed off by brick walls, barbed wire, and of course, guards. That didn't mean that individuals or even small groups could not get out of the ghetto if they resorted to bribes and other creative means. There were war parties that went into the city on a daily basis. The Lithuanian and Polish guards could be bribed with money and other favors. As a last resort, there were always the sewers. The odds of escaping the ghetto were in your favor if you knew or maintained contact with Polish families in the city, which we did. Although that did not always work, as frequently they would betray potential escapees for rewards from the police. The Judenrat was the Jewish council. They were responsible for the administration of the ghetto. There was also a ghetto police whose job it was to maintain order and to round up people for deportation. The leader of the ghetto was a man whose name was Jacob Gans. He must have been guided by some kind of mystical or magical fantasy that if he acceded to the German demands for bodies on a regular basis, then he would be able to save people. When he realized that this was not going to happen, as the Germans made bigger and bigger demands, he committed suicide, or perhaps he was killed. It was never clear. Now, the Germans were smart enough to realize that if they were able to help normalize life in the ghetto, then there would be less resistance to the coming liquidation. The ghetto had excellent medical facilities, which predated the German occupation. Consequently, there were no major disease epidemics compared to other ghettos. There were numerous cultural events such as original plays, lectures, and concerts. I remember attending plays with my mother and grandmother. My mother knew the lead actress from one of her school days, and so we went backstage several times to say hello to her. I'm sure that seeing plays made me feel good. However, such moments were rather few and far between. I remember certain original songs that we used to hum and sing. Never say that this is the final path. For those of you who know Yiddish, it means Zognit Kemo as the Geis Dan Wetzten Weg. Another song was called named Srolik, I am a lad from the ghetto. The lyrics of the, of the song had something to do with the fact that even though things are bad, I still managed to, to jump, dance, and sing. I suppose that anything to make one feel good and even hopeful for a brief moment was important and very significant. I must have had some kind of schooling experience that I'm unable to recall. Maybe it was fuzzy because teachers kept disappearing. I think the people in the ghetto made a concentrated effort to maintain a sense of normality under abnormal circumstances. Just how effective this was is impossible to determine but the effort in itself was somewhat meaningful and perhaps deceptive because after all, we were all waiting to die. By the time we regained use of our house, most of the people were removed and found other places to live. Once again, the unanswered question as to what happened to these people was responded to with silence. I have little doubt that the main reason that I survived the ghetto experience rel relatively unscathed emotionally was the love and the protection of my grandmother. I missed her more than anyone that I was ever close with. She shielded me and protected me from all the terrible things around us. It was that she enveloped me with her love and that nothing could harm me. She was always there no matter what the conditions or the circumstances. I can recall her sad face and I can never remember her smiling because by this time she had lost a husband and two sons. It's kind of hard to smile under such conditions. Well, I was not privy to the conversations and the dealings of the adults around me. I got the sense that something was being planned and I didn't dare ask what it was. 
I was sure that, they, that my questions would not be answered. There was rumors of a concentration camps and there were people being gassed. And not far from Vilna, there was a place called Ponare where people were killed and their bodies were covered with soil and lime. I'm assuming that a large portion of the ghetto population is buried in Ponare. There were black bunting on the trees when the Russians defeated the Germans at Stalingrad. There were recurrent rumors that the Germans were losing the war and there was an awareness that we would be killed or sent to concentration camps before the Russians could liberate us. There were rumors from work parties that the people escaped into the forest because, and to join the partisans, because the, Pol the at least the forests in Poland and Belarus were temporary places of some safety. But the surrounding forests were relatively safe haven. Survival was also heard that the Polish and the Lithuanian populations were of little help to the escapees. I finally understood that my mother's frantic activity and occasional disappearance had something to do with our escaping the ghetto. My mother, in conjunction with other people, was setting up a hiding place outside of the city. While I have been rather critical of my mother, her mothering, and her relationship with my grandmother, I was equally cognizant of her many strengths and the resilience of her character. She was very resourceful and that she had ample funds at her disposal, which made life a heck of, heck of a lot easier. Now, how all this came together and how it was organized, I mean, the place outside of the city, and how the various people were selected was never explained. All I know knew was that there was a place waiting somewhere out there, and at the proper time, you will walk out the front gate. On a couple of occasions, the plans were changed because the guards changed and another night, the night wasn't dark enough for us to get out. My mother maintained contact with a number of people who were equally committed to escaping. However, who it was and how it was decided was never explicit since there was no per one person in charge of the escape. This was all very secretive because if word got out that an escape was being planned, more people would want to join. And of course, there was very limited space. There was also the question as to who could be trusted since some of the people in the ghetto communicated with the Germans. The prearranged day for escape finally arrived. All I remember was that it was cold and dark and I was dressed in several layers of clothing since we, there was a limit to how much we could carry. My grandmother and I stood at the courtyard, which was next to the gate. And while my mother was negotiating with the guards about the money, it was something for us to stay there and not go anywhere. As my mother was walking back, I realized that my grandmother was not coming with us and that we were leaving her behind. As I was saying goodbye to her, I asked if I would ever see her again. And she said she didn't know. All I remembered was the next moment my mother grabbed my arm and we hurriedly walked out of the gate. Now the question was why we left my grandmother behind is something that has stayed with me and haunted me most of my life. The simplistic way of looking at it is that for everyone that survives, someone else has to pay the price. And so I lived and my grandmother died. That doesn't answer the basic question about the choices that people have to make. Such choices were part and parcel of the Holocaust equation. I did ask my mother about it and because I missed my grandmother, I didn't get much of a response except some vague dismissive comment that I wouldn't understand. My mother was never good at confronting emotionally charged issues such as what happened to my father. Maybe it was a practical decision that she felt that my grandmother would be too much of a burden because of her age. It's possible that the guards would only allow two people at a time to leave and that was it. My mother had to make a painful choice. It was also possible that my grandmother refused to leave because and chose to remain because the place that she was familiar with rather than take a chance on something that was unknown. When I was little, I felt that it was my fault that she died and my mother chose to save me. 
My mother was excellent at reinforcing that belief. Whenever she was unhappy with me, she would let me know that she wished that she left me behind instead of my grandmother. It was her own guilt that she projected onto me. Nevertheless, as much as I would to rationalize her decision, the guilt, my guilt was never far behind. As we exited the ghetto, I could not see much as the experience became a big blur. My mother was clutching my hand. I was standing next to her. I felt like I was being dragged. I asked where we were going and I got no response. As it turned out, we went to spend the night at the home of this Polish couple that used to work for my parents. I found out that these people were storing some of my parents' belongings and that they would keep them if we didn't survive. All these items would remain with the family. We experienced a sense of relief and freedom in leaving the ghetto, but little did we know that our prison-like experience was just beginning. We woke up the next morning on a gloomy rainy day. The sky was overcast as thick dark clouds rolled over the city. That was good as this was my mother and I would not be as visible. After we ate, the gentleman told us that the ghetto is surrounded by German police and it's going to be liquidated. I still nurture the hope that my grandmother would survive and that I would see her again. I entertained this fantasy for a long time until finally it hit me as to how she must have felt being left alone and knowing that soon she's going to die. We then began to track across the city to our prepared hiding place. My mother had a dark complexion and dark curly hair, but she wrapped a thick scarf to cover most of her features. I, however, being fair skinned and blonde haired was left uncovered. Such a precaution was essential since we were close to the ghetto. There was at least one other time that my being fair skinned and blonde was an asset that may have contributed to our survival. My mother hailed a horse-drawn carriage that we took across the city. I could tell it was far because the house was close to railroad yards. The house was situated in the middle of nowhere, which was good as it was safe from the prying eyes of neighbors. We entered the small undistinguished cottage, which was inhabited by an older woman with two unmarried daughters. The house had all sorts of religious icons and crosses on the walls, which was rather strange for me and fascinating at the same time. Being exposed to having all of these non-Jewish religious items thrust at me for the first time in my life made me uncomfortable. I thought that I was being disloyal to the one and only Jewish deity. The old woman that was going to hide us was short, witch-like, with a deformed spine. One of the daughters had reddish hair with angry pinched, an angry pinched face, while the other one was indistinct. My mother and the old woman engaged in a lengthy discussion, probably dealing with payment for hiding us. Money issues, of course, as you can tell, have come up periodically. We then walked a couple hundred yards to a large tool shed on a small elevation. We entered the shed through large doors and huge windows that looked out upon the railroad yards. There were wooden counters around the walls of the shed and beneath one of the counters, there was a trap door that went down a ladder into a cellar that contained 18 other people. This hiding place was to be our home for the next 11 months. Ideally, the people did not appear distinctive, which was probably a function of the darkness in my anxiety. I then noticed a blonde haired boy who was a couple years older. His name was Lolek, and he was there with his parents. He was an attractive young woman, probably in her 20s, and she was alone. Her name was Rivka. Our friend Moishe, who stayed with us in our house in the ghetto, was there, which was a comforting, familiar face. Harmony was non existent, as there were frequent fights, probably about space and money, as to who was paying more. When in theory we should have become one big happy family, it never happened because the reality until they were at the very end when survival was at stake. Until that desperate moment, we existed in a constant state of tension, fear. There was a fear in relation to what was happening outside, especially trusting the three women. Would they betray us? 
I think that we also experienced fear in relation to one another. The tempers were short with frequent flare-ups over minor issues. Now, how this place was set up ahead of time and who was involved in building it was never talked about. Who and how this Polish family was found was also not known. They took a large risk in making the commitment as to what one could label them as righteous Gentiles. However, they also got a lot of money for doing this. And at the end, I trade, they tried to betray us, but it was too late. All the same, they took a big risk. And if we were discovered, they would have been shot for harboring Jews. For that alone, we appreciated what they did for us. Seeing our hiding place for the first time must have made a profound impression on me. At various times, it was seen as a cellar. I guess you could call it a basement. But to me, it more looked like a big cavern that housed 20 bodies of various size and shapes. The characteristics that has stayed with me all these years is the darkness of the place. There was no electricity, we had candles, and, and we hardly ever used, and the walls were brick and very thick. The only light was a brick that was removed from the wall, which let daylight in. However, when it was dark or gloomy day, there was no light and we lived in semi-darkness. I think it's significant as to whether by chance or design, the missing brick was from the Eastern walls. Of course, the Russian armies that liberated us came from the East. I was always conscious of which incidents from the time in the ghetto left permanent marks on my personality. The wish to avoid darkness at all costs was a significant preoccupation. I need to inform you that when my wife and I go into a room, uh, she turns down the lights. I am inclined to make Commonwealth Edison wealthy. The beds were lined up along the walls. Most of the people had few belongings as there was little room. The place was clean and well-maintained as people tried to cooperate on a day-to-day -day basis, although it was not easy. Most of the time we stayed downstairs, only in the evening we ventured into the shed, two or three people at a time. This was essential in order to keep quiet and not to call attention to the shed, but also to enjoy the little freedom that was allotted to us. The three women that took care of us made sure that we stayed within the prescribed boundaries. Now we had a rather strange, hostile dependent relationship with our three caretakers. They brought us food twice a day in large pails and buckets while removing waste. It was the two daughters that brought us our meals. We never saw the old lady except until the very end. <clears throat> the food consisted of soup, bread, vegetables, and fruit. It was adequate, nothing special. <clears throat> uh, we never had any conversation with them and they of course didn't talk to us either. Nevertheless, we always wondered what they were thinking. On two occasions, they scared us by banging on the shed's doors when, when we got into loud discussions in the evening. In looking back, I realized that I do not remember some of the people, even though we were thrown together into such tight quarters. However, I can recall individuals that had an impact on me. The person I remember the most is a gentleman in his 50s his name was Yablonsky. He was a great storyteller, and so I spent a lot of time with him, partly because we both experienced physical problems. I with my stomach, sensitive stomach, and while he complained over arthritic pains. I have a clear memories of laying next to his bunk, and he enthralled me with such stories about tales of the Arabian Nights, Sinbad the Sailor, and of course, Princess Scheherazade. He was the moral compass of the group, and the final arbiter of all disagreements, as there were many. Another person that stood out in my mind was the young woman, Rivka. She was personable, outgoing, and most importantly, she spoke German. Rivka knew German flawlessly because she probably learned it in school. She was instrumental in our survival. After the war, my mother kept in touch with her and visited her in London. I guess this people with whom we had contentious relationships while in hiding were perhaps more meaningful and more important than I realized. Lolik was the only other youngster. He was 10 years old while I was seven. And for some reason, he and I never connected, though we always were friendly to each other. 
maybe the age difference was too large. And I ran into him after the liberation and he introduced me to his friends as someone that he survived with. That made me feel good and I looked up to him as an older brother. Thinking back, I couldn't help but wonder what we did with all the time and how we passed the days. We had minimal reading material, which was mostly in Polish. And perhaps this was one of the reasons why there were so many arguments as there were no outlets to discharge excess emotional energy. Boredom and anxiety were ever present. And I'm sure we spent a lot of time sleeping. In the evenings and at night, we would open the trap door and climb up into the shed in small groups on a rotating basis. We looked forward to these upper level excursions as it gave us a chance to experience the outer world without stepping outside. I recall a scary incident when we were out in the shed in the evening as someone dropped something that made a loud noise, which was, it was dropped accidentally. A guard patrolling the railroad yards heard the noise and looked in our direction. We froze as it seemed that he was staring right at us even though he was several hundred yards away. We were fearful that he would come closer to investigate, but he did not and he continued on his rounds and we breathed a sigh of relief. Even though the time dragged on, spring did turn into summer and we had an inkling that there were changes in the air which were totally unrelated to the seasons. The railroad yards were busier and more traffic. We could count the trains carrying troops and supplies from west to east. We could also see an increase in fortification, such as anti-aircraft guns, camouflage, and lots and lots of barbed wire. It was not long before we were able to figure out the reason for this heightened activity. One night in the midst of all this commotion, there was a loud noise and then we realized that we were being bombed. German airplanes, I mean, Russian, excuse me, Russian airplanes, air raid sirens, searchlights, and the explosion of bombs were all over. We assumed at first that these were Russian planes and we were joyful that the water was coming closer to us. We were perhaps on the threshold of liberation, which of course we always hoped for. However, our initial excitement subsided when the bomb exploded within our line of sight. A large piece of the bomb's casing fell against the outside wall of the shed and it lodged beneath one of the windows. That could have easily decimated a portion of our hiding place. We did not fully appreciate that railroad yards can become an appealing and inviting target for bombing. Initially, the air raids were only at night. After a while, they increased in frequency and intensity, and then they began to appear in broad daylight. Sleeping became more difficult as people would stay up all night to keep track of the ongoing activities. The anxiety about being bombed out of our hiding place. There was much activity in our area with an increased massing of troops and an increase in fortifications. All three of the gentle women showed up one day to discuss future plans and changes in routine, which of course scared us. It was evident that the war zone was moving closer, but we had no idea how this change was going to affect us. The first thing that they demanded was that from now on, we had to remain in the cellar all the time. Otherwise we could be detected and seen more easily since there were many more eyes all around. No more visits to the shed at night. They also will remain in their house, which meant there were to be less frequent visit, which implied less food. They demanded that we ration the food from now on. Even in the cellar, we were expected to remain quiet and whisper to one another. They were aware of our tendency to argue. They became much more cognizant of the possibility of being discovered and the implication of our presence. I suppose that they could always plead ignorance about our being there, while one could be ignorant maybe one or two people, but it'd be difficult to explain 20 people hiding on their property without being aware of it. As the days of increased confinement were on, we became more tense and spent every second peering out of our little window for telltale signs of what was going on outside. We created all sorts of fantasies and fanciful scenarios about the outside world. We were hoping for a quick German surrender and the appearance of Russian troops. 
However, what finally occurred was just the opposite. As the bombing diminished, we became aware of artillery fire, which meant that the war zone was drawing closer and we could find ourselves right in the midst of it. We kept track of the explosions and their intensity, but our conclusions were pure guesswork. We lost complete contact with the three women. As a result, we became totally isolated from the outside world without any food or water. We were aware of marked increase in the frantic activity right above us in the shed and much talking and the barking of orders in German. So instead of our wishes for the Germans to surrender meekly, it became evident that our shed had become the focus of another Stalingrad-like battle. I had no inkling at the, at the time that this was going to become the most horrendous week in my life. Now I would like to take a pause at this point and tell you a little bit about my father. Uh, the reason I haven't said anything about him because I didn't know him. My father was a lawyer and then he was drafted by the Polish army and he was an officer uh, during, during the war. And then of course he disappeared when I was two and a half years old. I have a couple of grainy pictures to remind me of what he looked like, but that's about it. Now, I don't really know what happened. I mean, he was killed obviously, but I didn't know what happened to him. He could have been killed by the German troops that overran Poland in 1939 or he could have been killed by the Russians at the Katyn Forest Massacre, in which 21,000 Polish soldiers, officers, and intellectuals were killed by. Uh, some years back, I went to the Polish Museum in Chicago to see if I could track down any information, especially in relation to what happened at Katyn. Uh, we spent the whole day there, my wife and I, looking at photographs and documents, but unfortunately, I found almost nothing. So as a result, I have no idea what happened to him, how he died and where he died. At this point, I would like to focus on something that may pique your interest a little bit to talk about the liberation. After being cooped up for long stretches of time with limited access to the outside world, we became attuned to what was happening outside. So this was how we assessed the military situation. The Russians were in the village, a couple hundred yards away. We could see the fluttering of the red flag. The Russians were very fond of their artillery. So they used that instead of using infantry to extrude the Germans. The Germans were in a great position defensively as our cellar and shed were elevation with excellent visual command of the area. They had either one or two machine guns, which kept the Russians at bay by spraying the area intermittently. The staccato machine gun noise became a familiar sound. So there emerged a military stalemate between the Russian artillery and the German machine guns. The Russians were hoping that their superior artillery could knock out the Germans and then their liberation of the area would be easy. The problem with that idea was that we were caught right in the middle. This standoff lasted for four days and three nights. By the way, our impressions about what was transpiring militarily were surprisingly accurate, as we found out about from our liberators later on. Since it was the middle of summer, it was very hot and we became desperate. Two of the people drank their own urine. I licked the dew from bricks in the morning. The tension, the thirst and the hunger were just too much. We could tolerate the hunger, but the thirst was awful. The Germans above us in the shed, the uncertainties of our fate and the liberation so close yet so far were just too much. As a result, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Epstein, his teenage son and our friend Moshe lifted the trap door and they ran out of the cellar. Just where they would go and what they were planning to accomplish was not clear as this was a desperate suicidal act. We then waited for the Germans to come down since the men ran out, but so far nothing occurred because they left on the third day of our confinement, but it was quiet and so we breathed a sigh of relief. We deliberated about what to do and how long we could tolerate such conditions. There were suggestions that we should run out into the open and take our chances. Maybe we could tell them who we are and hope that they would have pity on us. It was well 
if we all ran out at the same time and scattered in different direction, then some of us would maybe survive. On the afternoon of the fourth day, the thing that we dreaded the most finally happened. The trap door opened very slowly and the head of a helmet, a German soldier, peered into our hiding place. He came down the ladder and then another one and a third one. They looked around with a certain amusement. What they saw was a bunch of women and two blonde haired boys. The men were out of sight, hidden behind clothing and blankets under the beds. There were five men. And then Rivka, our German speaking savior, sprang into action. She told them that we were Polish, and that we were hiding from the Russians. We hear that the Russian soldiers are savages and that they rape women and that they kill innocent women and children. We told them that we were hungry and thirsty, that we had been hiding from the Russians for four days. All this was not pre-planned. It was a spontaneous story that the Germans believed. Today, to this day, I cannot understand how and why they believed that story. They made a connection with the three men that ran out before, but they didn't see how they may have been related to the rest of us. Maybe Rivka was a great actress. Maybe we looked frightened and too haggard to be a threat. After all, these were frontline troops too preoccupied with their own survival in the midst of fighting a war. And so for the next four days, we coexisted with the Wehrmacht. They treated us well, they gave us water, a little food. In fact, one of the soldiers, soldiers gave me a piece of chocolate. They never looked for, nor did they ever discover the men that were hidden under the beds. I know, it sounds strange. We shared our space with our enemy who could turn on us any minute and kill us. The fear and the terror that consumed us during these four days were beyond comprehension. It became obvious that our hiding place has become a primary fortification against the onrushing Red Army. By the second day, the Germans built a trench to the cellar to the back of the shed where they set up a command post. There was a table with a map, wires and constant orders were being barked back and forth. There was an invisible wall between them and us as they went about the business of war and we were preoccupied with our survival. It was essential for us to remember to talk in Polish among ourselves, which was not easy and occasionally forgotten. Rivka became the policewoman in our conscience to make sure that we were quiet, whispered only in Polish, and that Lola and I were prominently displayed. There was a major incident during the second day of our coexistence. The Germans were dug into their position solidly and they were not dislodged while the Russian artillery shelling intensified. Suddenly, a Russian artillery cell made a direct hit on the east wall of our hiding place. And it seemed that everything exploded. The wall started to crumble, bricks were flying all over. There was dust, there was chaos and the smell of gunpowder. People were screaming and the woman was sobbing in Yiddish and she was being buried. People pulled her out and she was fine, except someone put their hand over her mouth to keep her quiet. In my panic, I ran into the German command post to get away from the chaos into a place of safety. The German soldiers shooed me back to the cellar and yelling at me, rouse, rouse, which of course means get out. The next thing that I remember is someone grabbed me by the shoulder and pulled me back into the cellar. In some miraculous way, the explosion led to a few minor scratches, but no one was injured. In some miraculous way, we made it, at least at the moment, and felt some relief. The older woman continued to scream and cry in Yiddish again, and once again, someone forcibly so closed her mouth. After the explosion, one half of our hiding place was in rubble. Some of the men were terrified of being buried alive, but we positioned them while the soldiers were too busy to notice. The soldiers congregated in the command post, pouring over the maps, or we were hopeful that they were planning to withdraw. While this was going on, they did give us some crackers and water. It was obvious that they had more important things on their minds than as to who, was the, who were these strange people that were next to them. As far as they were concerned, we did not exist. Now with the line of fire cleared, 
we saw the red flag fluttering in the breeze. We were also aware of how much more activity in the flag area, which meant that the Russian troops were preparing for some kind of frontal assault against the German positions. It seemed that the German machine guns were not chattering, not as frequently. There was a constant state of dread as we had no idea what was coming next. We sat and lay on the floor attached to our spots like statues. Now we were afraid of the Russian artillery for which we were wide open targets. Someone suggested that we should label a piece of red cloth but it was decided not a great idea. It was dangerous and we sat there rooted to our spots waiting for the next explosion. The third night it became evident that the Germans were getting ready to retreat. Things were getting quieter and it looked like they were collecting their equipment, disconnecting their phone cables and folding the maps. We heard snatches of conversation, but were, there were fewer voices and some strange sounds with, which we couldn't determine. A German officer came to talk to Rivka. He told her that they were leaving and going back to the city to continue the war. They suggested that we come along that the Russians are wild animals that rape women and kill children. I know it's a familiar refrain. For our safety, we should retreat with them. Otherwise, they couldn't guarantee our fate. She thanked him for his concern and said that she needed to consult with the rest of the group to make it look like we were debating what to do. We had no intention of going back with them. So she went back and told him that the children are sick from the lack of food and water, that we were and we were too weak to go anywhere. The hidden issue, of course, were the men under the beds. What would happen to them if we left? And so he wished us luck as Rivka told him that we would take our chances and remain where we were. He said he couldn't do any more for us. And then he said goodbye and left. And so the rest of the night was probably one of the longest nights of our lives because we sat and waited and still had no idea what was going on around us. We heard women's voices and perhaps the Polish women were trying to betray us. And then there was the question of the three men that ran out. Where were they and would they tell the Germans about the rest of us? We sat through the whole night in total silence, terror and darkness. It seemed like any minute something bad could happen. As the dawn, at dawn it began to rain, heavy at first and then it settled into a light drizzle. Still, we refused to move as everything around us was quiet while the explosions moved further and further away. We sat in the midst of our minimal shelter and most of our hiding place was a pile of rubble. As the German officer walked away, we sat there stunned and scared at the same time we since he had no idea what was coming next. We talked in whispers, not believing that the Germans were actually leaving. Maybe they were hiding someplace and maybe they were, they were going to go after the Russians if they attacked. The artillery shooting continued, although it seemed that they were further and further away, which was a good sign. We did not dare to contemplate, even think about anything good. The night in some ways was apart from the distant shooting as everything was eerily quiet. We were scared that maybe the three women betrayed us. And this was how we spent the rest of the night. It was by far one of the longest nights of the year. Nobody slept as we just sat quietly motionless, fearful, and waiting for the reassurance of the dawn. We were too scared to move or even talk. And then out of the silence, we heard a Russian phrase, which I will never forget for the rest of my life. It said, it was Gye Commandir Nashe Rote, which means where is the commander of our squad? And so one of the women became excited and she wanted to rush out and greet the Russian soldiers. However, somebody grabbed her and pulled her back and told her that it was a German trick. And if the Germans see us greeting the Russians, they would shoot us. And so once again, we didn't move, we sat back and we waited. I don't know how long it was. Was it minutes, was it hours? But we sat there nevertheless and waited. And then we looked up and there stood a Russian soldier there was another one and then another one. And all of a sudden we realized that we were free and that no one was going to be a threat to us anymore. 
And so we ran up to them. We thanked them in Russian, saying spasibo, spasibo, which is thank you, Russia. We embraced them, we hugged them, and we cried. The Russians were friendly, but they looked at us quizzically as they couldn't figure out as to who we were and how we got there. Some of the people could speak Russian, but nevertheless, they still couldn't comprehend our presence there. We started to worry that perhaps they would see us as spies or subversive, since, you know, they were at war in part with the Poles and with the Lithuanians who were not eager to see Russians. There was a certain beauty and irony in our liberation. It was very significant and important to mention. A footnote, in a sense. The officer of the Russian troops that liberated us was Jewish. He was from far away from Minsk, which was 400 kilometers away, Belarus. And he said that he never expected to see Jews in this part of the country. It was very hard to communicate with him. Uh, he spoke a few phrases in Yiddish, and of course, we hardly knew any Russians. And besides, he sort of disappeared after a few days because the war was still in progress. But the point is that the ultimate beauty of this is that a Jew liberated us. And so to be freed from the Nazis by a Jew was the ultimate victory. It doesn't get any better than that. And so we kept mar he kept marveling at how it was that we survived since he aimed his artillery batteries point blank at our shed and at the cellar. The Russians were puzzled how we wound up in this seemingly forsaken place, how the Germans didn't kill us and how their artillery didn't kill or even wound any one of us. That in itself was a miracle. By the way, we found the bodies of the three men and the three gentle women, they were killed, of course. They were shot, but we didn't know by whom, whether the Russians or the Germans, or maybe both. And so after the liberation, we remained close to our demolished hiding place for several days, as we were in a fog, dazed, and uncomfortable with our emotions. If you remember uh, the movie Schindler's List, the, the ending of the movie was a bunch of peace survivors were walking down this empty road and a soldier stops them and says, where are you going? There is no place for you to go because everything has been destroyed. There were still pockets of fighting in the city and we couldn't go there until some of the people started to drift back. And so it was the summer of 1944. And even though I was only eight years old, I started to feel that something was different, and that something was starting to change inside of me. I realized that we survived some bad things, but my mother and I came out of it in pretty good shape. I started to think about the future, about going to school, about playing, playing with other kids, about reading, reading books, which of course I had never, never done before. And these thoughts kept coming back to me over and over again because there was the harbinger of things to come. And so it occurred to me to remember and to record just what we had been through. And that's just what I did. And so it seemed that all of these thoughts were swirling around in my head as everything else was behind me. And so I finally realized that the things that have happened were not the end of anything at all, but they were only the beginning. Any questions, any comments? Thank you so much, Ben, for sharing this, um, your amazing story. It's, it just took my breath away to hear. I'm sure a lot of people feel that. Um, so thank you for sharing it. And thank you to your kids for coming to you and, and asking you to write it down and to tell this story because it's so important, um, you know, that, that these stories of survival and, um, 
and story, you know, just are told and that they're part of our history. Um, thank you so much. So I don't know if um, people have questions. Um, there's a question in the chat here. And have you ever been back to your hiding place or um, or to that town? Vilna. Vilna? Yeah. No, no I've never been back. How long after um, the liberation did you come to the States or how did you get to the States? Oh, that's a long involved story. Um, <laughs> I, my mother, okay, my right mother who married, actually my stepfather was a soldier in the Russian army. And uh, we, uh, we uh, the Haganah snuck us through Poland and Czechoslovakia, Austria. We wound up in the Americans in Germany, in a DP camp. Um, we had relatives in, have relatives in Israel with whom we keep in touch with, but my stepfather had family in the States, in Peoria. And so this is how we came here. I came here in 1949, I was 13 years old. There's a question in the chat. What happened to Rivka? And do you stay in touch with her or anybody else who was yeah. with? Yeah, my mother stayed in touch with Rivka and she also was in touch with this gentleman, Yablonsky that I mentioned that used to tell stories. Uh, I think he went to Israel and I don't, I'm sure he was older and I'm sure he was gone after a while. Uh, those are the only two people that we've kept in touch with. Um, what, do you remember the name of the DP camp you were in? Yeah, were we were in two different camps. We were in Wetzlar, which was in Hessen, I think. And, and then we were in Heidenheim for a while before we came to the States. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Those are the ones I've pulled from the chat. Um, and um, if other people have questions or you want to unmute. Um, or make comments. Can I ask a question? Thank you so much for sharing this. It was amazing. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, did you write down uh, what had happened to you as a child as well, or just now? Is this the first time you've written anything down? No, actually, uh, I wrote a book about my experiences called The Child from the Ghetto. It's currently in, on the way to being published. Oh, wow. I, I just today got the cover for the book. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but recently you wrote it. Yeah, just in the, yeah. Last, in the past year, yeah. That's in response to my children's request. I, I, I understand. But you never wrote about it when you were young. No, I did not. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I guess there was a time when I was, I was not too eager to talk about it. Yes. No, that makes sense. Um, a couple more things coming up in the chat. First, hello from your cousin, Sherry Garber. Um, Elena writes, my father, her father, well, Quote, my father was a soldier in the Russian army and liberated people in Poland. He never shared anything. He never shared much of anything and sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, uh, there's a question. Um, how does the current political environment um, with Trump trigger past Trump? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> I think, I'm just reading here. Um, I apologize, but that, that's... That's, that's, that's not where my head is right now. <laughs> um, how have your experiences informed your professional practice? That's an excellent question. Uh, part of my training, of course, as I said, in psychiatry and psychoanalysis, uh, I was one of the founders of the Bar Harris Children's Grief Center. This was a clinic devoted to helping children who have lost a parent. I'm sure it had something to do with what I've been through. I was a director of that clinic for 17 years. It's ongoing and it was one of my proudest activities in my practice. Um, anybody else have any questions? When were your book be out? Uh, it's a, I don't know. Uh, you know, these things move very slowly. I mean, just getting the cover from, from an artist took a month. So um, I, I think it's coming down to the end stages. It has to be 
uh, I checked out again. It has to be put together. I would say uh, probably in the next, probably in March sometime. Well, I hope you'll you'll let us know. Either you can email me or let me know via um, Mally or Jill because I'm sure people will be really interested in reading. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Mally know. Thank you. Um, a couple other questions. How do you think your experiences affected how you parented? Uh, excellent question. Given the fact that I'm a child psychiatrist, uh, <laughs> I've raised three children and we have eight grandchildren. As far as I know, thanks to my wife and I, I think they've turned out pretty good. Other than that, I can't tell you. They seem to be okay. My, all my, my, my three daughters are married to Jewish men, uh, you might say. So that in itself is, I think, significant. Um, other than that, I have said, I have eight green, grandchildren. One is working for Amazon. One graduated from Northwestern. One is, uh, one is at Illinois. I mean, there are different schools all over the country. Um, Washington, yeah, and Washington. Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. Two of my grandkids are in Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. And Highland Park High School. <laughs> and Northwood's Grade School. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> They're all here. Almost all of them are here. There. Did your mother talk about her experiences? Um, no, she did not. My mother was very tight lipped and very guarded and she never talked about my father and um, she never talked about anything and as the years went by I think she withdrew in a kind of a shell and she used to worry that Germans were hiding next to our house and she would pull down the shades and lock the doors so she well you know she certainly was amazing in how the two of us survived but toward the end the, toward as you got older she became more and more reclusive and distant. Um, there's a question um, about your accent. You have a very, very slight accent. Yes, um, I know. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, it came to the States. I didn't know any English. So I had to learn everything from, from the beginning. And fortunately, I liked school. I always enjoyed school and I did well in school. So in, I learned English pretty quickly, but uh, I guess I'm, and it's interesting when I'm not anxious when I'm not, not speaking in front of people, my accent is gone uh, pretty much. It comes back in these kind of situations. What message do you want uh, younger generations to take from the story? Excellent. The questions you guys have asked are terrific. I think that the main thing is for them to know and understand where they come from. I think that is important more than anything else. Well, thank you for sharing so that we can keep passing this on. How do you feel today after sharing your remarkable story with us? Uh, well, uh, let me tell you a little anecdote. Uh, some 20 years ago, I was interviewed for the Steven Spielberg uh, Museum, Holocaust Museum. And uh, I, was being, I was interviewed by actually another psychiatrist, a friend of mine. And so for two weeks prior to being interviewed, I couldn't sleep. I had nightmares. Okay? After I gave the interview, I was fine. That's the best. It's the best explanation I can give you. Do you have a question? I just hear someone say they have a question. Please share. Ben, it's Mally. I want to thank you for sharing your story. Though I've known you many years, I've not known your story. And I think I can share from all of us to say that it's a privilege to hear a firsthand testimony of what you've lived through. It might be difficult for you, but it was a gift to all of us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. And I looked actually, I looked forward to coming here and my wife and my one of my daughters asked me whether I was nervous and I said, no. Glad. I think that's, that's significant. Uh, 
Um, there's another question. Are you able to visualize this as you tell the story? Do you see it yeah, happening? I can see it. I can see the pictures as clear as, as day. And what's inc amazing to me, my, you know, I'm 84 years old. My memory is not that great. But these things that I talk about, I remember like they happened yesterday. It's like, it's like a video is in front of my face. So yes, I remember the details. I can, I can describe the weather in some of the places that, that I was. So yeah, I can, that I can remember better than other things. Some things just stay with you for the rest of your life. Elise, do you have a question? I do. I'm actually really curious. I know that you said that your children were the ones who came to you and asked you to start writing it down. The yes. question is actually, did any of your grandchildren come to you? And I ask because I am a second generation um, from Holocaust survivors. And only when I was in seventh grade and I went up to my grandmother and said, I want to know, I want to hear your story. Did she start to talk? And she only spoke to me. And so I'm intrigued, like, did any of your grandchildren come to you and try to get you to speak with them? Or was it really just recently when your children came to you? Well, yeah, here, no, it's not recently. I mean, actually, years ago, and I don't remember when my kids were still in junior high school and high school, one night, Passover, instead of having a Seder, uh, I asked them if they wanted to hear my story. And they said, yes. So I told them. Now, I didn't specifically discuss it with my grandchildren. I assumed it filtered down from my children to them. Uh, how much they know, I'm not sure. I don't know. But they certainly have expressed interest occasionally. And they have a pretty good idea of what I've been, what I've been through. I, I have to say, like, it was fascinating. My grandparents, as you mentioned for you, were also a part of the, um, the Spielberg uh, documentary. Right. Um, so like, I, I love to hear everybody's stories. I want to be able to carry and be able to teach all the coming generations about all the awful that people live through. And so I am very appreciative that you are here tonight telling us, because yeah, I think it's important. Yeah. That's why I was here. Right now the chat is filled with lots and lots of thank yous. People are really grateful um, for your time tonight, Ben. So thank you. Thank you for having me. If there aren't any more questions, um, we can adjourn for the evening. Any thoughts? So thank you again to Ben and thank you to Mally, um, who I've known forever. Um, and um, thank you to Jill Weinberg, who I think is on here. I saw your name somewhere, but thank you, Jill. Um, and thank you to everybody who came today um, to hear this important story um, and to be part of this community. So. Actually, actually, Jill was instrumental in my coming here. Yes. Um, yes. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to everyone who came and um, have a good evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mally. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the Bar Harris Center. It's an amazing place. Yep. Thank you, Papa. <laughs> Always <laughs> hear your story. Hi, Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Hi, Papa. Hi everyone. We we've talked to Papa before. We've we've asked him about his story before. We we went to the Holocaust Muse Museum a couple of years ago, and we had we had an afternoon together as well to talk to him about his story. If that answers that previous question. Thank you. Yeah. Is Michael? Hi, babe. Hi, babe. <laughs> we'll we'll just the whole family will stay for the end. <laughs> <laughs> We'll hop on. We'll have a family Zoom call Take after. Glad we could host. <laughs> Is there? I know you guys have been recording. Is there a way? Is, is there a way for us to get a copy of the recording?
Yeah, it takes overnight to kind of process in a way that I can share it and I'll be happy to share it um, so you can get it tomorrow. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. We've got some people who yeah. couldn't join us who are very interested in, in seeing it. So we'd love to be able to share it with some folks. So thank you. We appreciate it. Papa, when did you change the name of the book? I thought it used to be called Origins. No, Origins was my working title. Working title? Yeah. No, the, the title of the book is The Child from the Ghetto. Gotcha. That's a good title. Yeah. Yes. We look forward to reading it. Yeah. Oh, very excited. Ellie? Will you yeah, send me the... I think the Holocaust the Museum is going to keep it in their bookstore. And uh, I don't know, some, who else is in there? Oh, I don't know. My mom. I don't know my mom. Yeah. I want to see the cover art, though, that you said the artist took a month to make. I mean, that's a long time. Yeah. Well, these things move very slowly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Ellie, please thank the Akiba Schechter community for joining us tonight and for making this possible and for you for having the vision to bring it all together. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome and thank you.